Hello everyone, welcome to the second video for YouTube on John and Jane's retirement, or I should say investment portfolio, but this one specifically is for Jane's retirement portfolio, and we're going to take a look at that. Um, you know, in this article I've added a couple of additional screenshots that I wouldn't normally include in my articles that I previously wrote on Seeking Alpha. So um, if anyone has thoughts, opinions, positive, negative, um, please let me know. Um, you know, if the if you find that the screenshots aren't really that helpful, um, then then I'd be happy to save the time not adding them. But if they if, if you find value in them, let me know and I'll be happy to continue adding them to articles in the future. So quick disclosure, I'm not a financial advisor and I don't claim to be one. Um, the, the views held in this article are my personal views and are not uh, uh, anything supported or reflected of, you know, by my employer. Um, every trade that's done in here is in a live system. It is a real portfolio. This is not a fake um, you know, portfolio being traded on play money or anything like that. Um, and I include the screenshots to make sure that that is apparent as well. And then in the future, I think I'll create an article um, referencing, or <laughs> I keep using the word article, I'll create a video referencing, you know, why I started doing this. Um, but as a quick overview, um, you know, John and Jane, Previously, we're being taken advantage of by their financial advisor, and um, that's something that I just won't stand for. And after you know talking to them, um, what it did was it encouraged me to actually um, get involved in better understanding the stock market and investments, um, because prior to that, I mean, I, I had a little bit of an interest, um, but not to the extent that it's evolved into. So um, whenever I find that people are treated poorly or, um, you know, something that just, I'm going to be honest, it angers me, um, I try to find a positive way to vent that anger um, and, and do something that's actually productive. And that's kind of how this whole series got started was out of the desire to provide people with additional information, um, let them make their own decisions, but um, at least give the tools um, whenever possible so that people can can you know make better decisions and and if anything handle their own portfolio or you know or maybe they choose to go with a financial advisor but just being aware of what's available I think is kind of the key takeaway. So with John and Jane um, I'll also in the future include this in a separate video um, about their background just so we don't have to cover this every time but right now they take $2,700 from their um, investment portfolio. $1,700 comes from the taxable, $1,000 comes from John's traditional IRA um, and then as far as the rest of their income it's basically just Social Security. So. Um, as far as, as what their actual income stream looks like, that that makes up all of it. Um, and then as far as their debt load goes, you know, they have done everything right as far as making sure that they have, you know, just the bare minimum bills um, every month in retirement. So there's there's no mortgages, there's no car payments, there's, there's nothing substantial um, that you know, would require a, a significant amount of income on a monthly basis. And in the account, uh, the traditional IRA um, definitely um, generated significantly more income, a um, little bit over $500 more income in 2023 compared to 2022 for the month of July. And then for the Roth IRA, it was just under $100 more was generated in July of 2023 compared to July of 2022. And then when, when looking at the balances, both um, traditional and Roth IRAs saw the account balances higher in July of 23 compared to July of 22. Uh, one thing about that that I do want to point out is because Jane is not taking any funds from her account, um, the balances in the traditional and Roth IRA 
um, for Jane have not performed as well as, as I would have liked to see. Um, because in the other accounts, or if you go back and watch my taxable article, you'll see that I actually do a calculation where I go back and I add in the income that was taken out of the account to see, okay, what was the return the account generated, um, uh, excluding that income, and then what was the um, return that account generated if I added that income back in. Um, and I believe it goes from 4.5% for a return without that income included and then with that income added back in it's just under eight percent so um i i find that in jane's account um, based on these balances you know it hasn't been as impressive as say for example the taxable account has been uh, six companies have increased the dividends in the month of july or paid an increased dividend in the month of july so of those, um, Realty Income and WP Carry, those have already been covered in the taxable uh, article, but there's Alexandria Real Estate, which was 2.5% increase. Bank of Nova Scotia was a 2.9% increase. Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce was a 2.4% increase. And Main Street Capital was a 2.2% increase. So um, although Canadian banks have traditionally been um, stalwart, you know, type institutions. Um, we've also been looking at or in in the process of reducing exposure uh, on those. So when it comes to the two that you see above Bank of Nova Scotia and the Canadian Imperial Bank, um, we are more than likely going to be selling off shares of Canadian Imperial Bank and um, you'll see more why uh, uh, about that when it comes to the, um, uh, the cost basis of the existing positions. Uh, basically, we can get more of a break even off of Canadian Imperial Bank than we can with Bank of Nova Scotia right now. And then as far as Maine goes, um, it's producing a record um, net, um, uh, net investment um, income. I say net investment, it's net interest income uh, uh, as a result of interest rate increases. So the spread between the cost of funds and then what their um, the companies that they have lent money to are paying has increased. And that is part of the reason why it's producing um, such strong earnings um, with the Fed continuing to raise interest rates. And then as far as um, Alexandra Real Estate goes, uh, much like almost every other real estate company, it's trading near its 52-week low. Uh, the fundamentals look good, though, when it comes to strong leasing volume and rent increases. So, you know, they typically beat um, their quarterly earnings. Um, and I believe their most recent quarterly earnings was a beat by four cents per share. Um, so moving forward, I mean, it's a huge company. Um, I think that they have some very attractive real estate and I think that it's a buying opportunity um, for those that, that, are, that are interested. So when you look at the cost basis for Alexandria Real Estate, um, you can see that we started adding back in mid-2022. Um, unfortunately, that was a little bit earlier um, than, than where we would have liked to have been. You know, obviously we didn't know how low the ball was gonna go, um, but especially when you see the, you know, the purchases at about $163 a share, that is definitely on the high, you know, end of the, of the cost basis. So, you know, we'll look to continue adding small chunks. Uh, in this price range, we're typically adding five to 10 shares at a time. Bank of Nova Scotia, um, as I was mentioning, you can see that the cost basis on here, we're sitting at a little bit more of a loss, and that's because of these shares that were originally purchased back in 2018, um, even though we had some purchases in 2020 um, during the initial stages of the pandemic that are obviously pretty attractively priced. Um, you know, it's not, but, but these represent such a small number of shares compared to these here. Um, so this is probably part of the reason why we're going to continue holding um, Bank of Nova Scotia. Now, when it comes to um, Canadian Imperial Bank, um, 
you can see that the you know if we were to sell off the entire position um, you know we'd be looking at a pretty minimal loss and again with the stock currently paying a dividend that's about the same as what a certificate is currently paying um, that's something that that I don't see a ton of upside in the stock which is part of the reason why selling it off and then having something you know that's consistent um, would would be good um, and then if the stock happens to drop further um, to where maybe there's a potential upside in the future um, I wouldn't be opposed to to buying shares again um, but it's just like I said there's just really no catalyst or no reason as far as I can see that, that owning this stock compared to a certificate makes sense at this point in time. Main Street Capital, um, you can see that we, we do our best to purchase shares when, when it becomes you know, attractive enough. Um, I typically want to see close to about the $33, $34 a share range. Um, it does depend on um, what, the, what the asset net average asset value is. Um, so in, in this case, we're seeing that continue to increase. Um, but you know, the current price at about 41, $42 a share has typically been a pretty strong ceiling. So I don't see a ton of upside necessarily, but based on the yield that's being paid and then the special dividends, um, it is well worth continuing to hold on to shares, um, of main street as far as I'm concerned. And then realty income, you can see here, now we might choose to purchase um, some more shares depending on if the price continues to fall more. Um, but once we do that, this kind of goes back to the strategy that we employ. And you'll see some of these in the transaction histories of when the stock price does uh, move back up and start to recover, that we will purchase enough shares um, you know, at a lower price to then be able to sell a higher cost position like this. So I'm constantly using that to lower the cost basis of positions and remove those higher cost basis, um, uh, you know, shares because um, it just, it, it, it makes it easier to sell shares later on if necessary. Um, and it's just it, it it's I see it as capital recycling and as a good practice um, because it also allows you to be able to sell off shares and then even purchase um, you know different um, sectors or companies when when they are more attractively priced. <clears throat> and then WP Carry, um, you can see that it's basically sitting at a break even. And then same strategy here. If we see the price. Um, go, you know, into the low 60s, upper 50s, we would definitely look at buying more shares. Um, and then when the stock price begins to return into the upper 60, low $70 a share range, that's when we would look at selling these guys off here. Now, to give you guys some actual examples of taking place, Aviant is probably the best one. Um, to be able to show you. So um, we've sold off a total of 150 shares in the month of July. And you can see that um, on these, I actually use the limit trades. So on the $41 and then $42 here. Um, so I set those ahead of time. And then when we get to the cost basis screen, you'll see why I did that. Um, but with the stock price in the $38 share range, um, it was definitely advantageous to sell off these shares, you know, now. And then also we were able to turn around and purchase more shares um, at the lower cost. Um, so now we have a cost basis that was originally some, some shares of Aviant, we, we had it like $45, $48 a share back when the, when the stock was, was in about the $55 a share range. Um, so we've been able to reduce those high cost shares down so that now we're, we're, we're running with a much lower cost basis for Aviant. And then we did do the same for Philip Morris here. You can see where we did set a limit trade. Typically when it gets to be over $100 a share, 
um, that's when I pr prefer or like to sell it off um, and then purchase in the low $90 a share range again. And then for the Roth IRA, you can see that with American Tower Corporation, we also set a limit trade at $200 a, sh uh, a share, and we sold off 35 shares. So it was a pretty substantial position, um, and that has really helped out because American Tower is currently trading in the $180 a share range, and that um, you know that would be about a $700 loss in value. If, if we would have held all these shares. And instead now, we have that money put back into the account so that we can choose to buy more shares at that lower cost basis so that when the stock price does recover, um, if, if that's, and, and I say that as a hypothetical, that it's not that we necessarily went and already bought shares of it, but if we were to buy shares of it with the assumption that stock price can move higher, um, that, that we, we improve our cost basis and, and reduce those high cost shares. So looking at the traditional IRA again, we have Aviant here. You can see that with Aviant, it was ended up being about $130-ish a share um, that we, or not a share, $130 that we lost on 150 shares. Um, and that compares to um, probably close to about what would have been ballpark, I think about $525 um, had we continued to hold those. Um, and then again, not to mention the fact that we wouldn't have had the funds to reinvest because we did recently in the month of August buy more shares of Aviant. So our cost basis is quite a bit lower on, on Aviant moving, moving forward. And in the month of August, I'll make sure to show a um, cost detail of Aviant so you guys can see what those positions look like. And then as far as Philip Morris goes, uh, again, you can see that we made a few bucks off of it, but um, this was a position that had a much higher cost basis. I believe this would have been about $95, $96 um, a share. So we were willing to sell that off and then again, be patient and wait for the stock price to drop back down to a level that we would find attractive again. And then as far as the Roth IRA goes, um, this is what I was saying about, um, American tower that we were willing to take, um, you know, the small loss here, um, because otherwise it would have been about a $700 a share loss if my if my math is correct so um, because we're talking about share price that's close to about $180 a share so now we actually have the capital to be able to reinvest and purchase more shares um, at that lower price um, without having this high cost basis so that's kind of what I mean when I say capital recycling um, typically capital recycling involves moving funds to a um, different sector um, or just holding it as cash for a while. Um, but the issue here is that these are older articles being the month of July as I try to get caught up again. Um, very rarely will you see stock prices swing significantly enough to where we're, we're selling in the same month as we're buying. Top uh, image here is going to be the year to date traditional um, IRA um, gain loss uh, measurements. And then as um, the bottom one is going to be for the traditional or, or sorry, the Roth IRA gain loss table. So um, you can see that, that, you know, for the shares that we've sold, um, that we've, we've made some pretty good gains off of those. Um, I always tell people to beware though when they're looking at this um, because it's easy for someone to be able to sell off things <clears throat> that they have, you know, to only sell off the winners. Um, but when I show you guys the current gain loss, um, <coughs> excuse me, current gain loss tables, you'll see that we're still sitting in the positive on those as well. So even though we've locked in a lot of gains for 2023, we still have a lot of gains um, that are that that haven't actually been been um, realized yet. 
So comparison here, um, EAFAX is one of the biggest reasons why we see such, such, uh, such a substantial increase in income in 2023. But also we have the addition of EOG resources and then ODBC. Um, so that is, um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, I believe it's Blue Owl. I'm drawing a blank here. Give me one second. And of course it doesn't want to cooperate. All right, hold on. Well, that's just strange. Okay, all right. Well, I'm not going to waste more time looking it up, but it's um, Blue Owl Capital, so uh, similar to Main Street Capital. Um, and you can see that um, ODBC was previously ORCC. Owl Rock. Sorry, it's Owl Rock. <laughs> um, but it was previously ORCC in 2022. Uh, but no income was collected in 2022. So um, the addition of EOG, ODBC, um, putting funds into SWVXX for a higher yield um, was the main contributors as to why we see um, the the five, almost you know over $500 increase in income. Um, and then also, you know, 2023's doesn't even include the recently purchased CD because the income for that um, isn't going to come in until the month of August. So after, once August shows up, it'll be monthly that, that the income from that rolls in. And then the Roth IRA comparison, again, EAFAX um, is the big contributor. And then the addition of Essex um, Property Trust um, was another one that was not on um, 2022's um, as far as the income goes. And then on the year over year full comparison, so we have an estimated 6.2% increase in the traditional IRA um, income and then the 2.3% increase in the Roth IRA. And I put yield on there and that is incorrect, but um, I am not going to go back and edit it at this point because this is taking me way too long to do already. Um, so it's a 6.2% increase in traditional IRA income and then 2.3% increase in Roth IRA income. Um, and then remember that the year over year increase does not factor in CD income because CDs start on um, uh, certain months. It, it'd just be too messy for me to try and actually keep all of that straight. Um, but the part that is highlighted in green does include CD income if it was collected during that month. So by the end of the year, um, the year over year increase will reflect what whatever CD income has been been received. And then as far as the account balances go, um, I've already went over that in the beginning that it's, um, you know, it, it's, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm disappointed, but I'm, I, I wish the performance had been a little bit better, especially given that Jane isn't actually taking any funds out. Um, but also, you know, we're probably not seeing as much capital appreciation due to the fact that, that we are emphasizing the focus on, on pushing money to cash um, and also to certificates and um, SWVXX and, and basically items that, that aren't going to produce capital appreciation. The six-year traditional income comparison, uh, you know, I think that this is always helpful to see um, because 2018 is when I started these articles. So, you know, these are accurate every single year. You can see that the, in, the, the dividend income increases pretty substantially. Um, if this year does end at 6.2%, um, that will be the lowest um, that it's increased by. Um, but, you know, these really high numbers in the beginning were impacted by the fact that, that we were going from a portfolio that didn't exist in 2018 to a portfolio that was becoming much more seasoned here. So, um, 
you know, still even in 2020 to see income increase um, during, you know, the COVID lockdowns and things like that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy overall with the amount of income being produced because it's also, you know, generating an income that is now twice as much as it was at the 20, end of 2018. It'll be more than double that by the end of 2023. And then for the Roth IRA, um, very similar situation here. Um, you know, it did not perform as well in, you know, during COVID um, lockdowns and things like that, but um, has since after that um, seen, seen pretty strong recovery. Um, yeah, so it's, it's going to be pretty weak overall for the increase year over year from 2022 to 2023, um, but still... <clears throat> more than double, um, you know, the income that it produced at the end of 2018, um, in 2023. So the cash balances, um, cash balances are at their highest point. Um, and I say that you, <clears throat> based on the current gain loss, which will be my, my next images that I show, um, these images are going to be from the statement at the end of July. So the other thing too is that, especially with this traditional IRA, the 13,562 um, did not reflect the $45,000 that are in SWVXX and then in the certificate. Um, so um, this number is really more like almost 60,000, so 58,562. Um, so that's something to, to take into consideration when I say that the cash balances are, are at the highest point. Uh, but with these accounts, you'll see that this is going to increase going into the month of August pretty substantially. And then, uh, as I mentioned, so with the unrealized gain loss comparison, you can see that in the month of July, it was saying that there was quite a bit of unrealized gains outstanding. These numbers are going to start to go down. And the biggest reason for that is because of the sales that we've recently done. Um, and my next couple of images will, will show a updated amount as of September 18th. Um, which is when I, I literally just updated the numbers right before I start making this video. So in here, you can see that instead of the 33 some odd thousand dollars of unrealized gains, there's now only about 12,000. Some of that has gone down due to the drop of stock prices. Um, but then the other part of it has gone down because you'll notice that the cash in the account as of September 18th is substantially higher um, than than what it was. I believe it was thirteen thousand, um, referencing the previous screen um, here. So basically, it's the sales have translated over now um, into cash and are no longer represented as unrealized gain loss. So um, this screen, I always say, I think is the most important because it shows the good and the bad. Um, and then, you know, it, it's makes it, if, if people are actually showing this screen along with, um, uh, you know, the, the other screens from, from Charles Schwab that, that showed the realized gain losses, um, this is, this is what would make it very difficult to try and hide someone's actual performance of how they're doing. You know, it's not possible to show both those screens and then be able to hide that you sold off a bunch of losers, you know, to make it look like your, your portfolio is performing, you know, better than it, than it really is. So, um, you know, all these numbers are from September. Sorry, I had said the 18th but the clock just switched over on midnight. All these numbers are from the 17th of September, which would have been market close of um, September 15th, would have been basically the last day that they were updated from. And then for the Roth IRA, again, same thing. You can see that the unrealized gains um, are down here, but you can see that the cash balances are also up 
um, pretty substantially. And um, I don't think I had much more to say about this page. I didn't want to change over to the next page too quickly until um, everyone's had a chance to be able to kind of look at the numbers and so conclusion um, I think I've said it enough during this article but expect to see cash balances increase as we reduce the number of holdings or the size of the positions um, the the current gain loss tables um, you know those actually reflect the the trades that were made in the month of um, August and September um, and I apologize that normally I would make these sooner so then that way there isn't um, such a disconnect between what shows on the statement period so I'm doing my best here in the next couple days to get caught up on all of um, July's articles so that I can get started on August and then um, you know hopefully get into September and then when it comes to um, the beginning of October um, that's when I'd be able to to release September's articles so that hopefully those are more relevant um, tax deferred accounts like the IRAs will have no impact on John and Jane's taxable income so expect to see quite a few more trades happening in those accounts as compared to the taxable account um, the taxable account I'm almost always trying to balance it out one for one um, so that there's no substantial tax hit um, or, or implications um, I don't even and if anything even if we sell off some that are that are losers um, usually I'm selling off some that are winners in the process as well because I, I don't even like to take a, a loss on those um, uh, uh, without balancing it out um, because I, I don't like selling off loser shares um, and not using that as as an opportunity to be able to sell off maybe some high flyers so lastly um, I'm not very optimistic about the trends of the market um, the safety offered by fixed income with five you know percent plus yields to me is is more than enough compensation to justify why you know we would move um, funds or why we would you know sell off um, stocks uh, that are trading you know at, at 52 week highs in some cases like um, Iron Mountain um, and then you know just taking those funds and rolling it over into a CD um, if there isn't a strong compelling upside reason for owning that stock I'm I'm just at this point it's just not it's not worth the risk so um, you know the other thing about this is that in my daily job um, I am looking at people's finances all day long and there's just kind of a as far as I'm concerned a brewing crisis um, you know that's going to be taking place and um, you know between um, people you know student loans coming back on people not being able to pay their rent um, people making just really poor decisions with their money um, you know the number of online lenders um, that do like buy now pay later loans and different things like that um, there's just a lot of really bad stuff going on and you know I'm not a fan of, of government regulation um, but at the same time there is uh, um, how would I put it like it's just it's there there's there's missing aspects of of understanding what kind of products are available online and that seems to be the thing like um, you know just to give everyone some perspective on this there's an app called Earnin where you can basically borrow against your your you know future income so instead of you getting your paycheck on a Friday and receiving a thousand dollars someone you know prior to that date could actually go in and borrow against it ahead of time and I believe that the the person um, what it requests is a tip um, 
you know, so you can tip them $5 to borrow $200 ahead of time. And what's happening is that person's getting the $200 and then they're not taking into consideration that when they go to get their paycheck on Friday, their paycheck's no longer $1,000. Their paycheck is going to be $795 because they tipped $5. I, I, I guess that's their way of getting around the whole fee structure piece of it or saying it doesn't you know cost them anything to do it. Um, but, um, you know, $795 because the $200 paid back plus the $5 tip. So, you know, I see accounts that have earning where they're just constantly using it, borrowing against the future paychecks. And then they're pretty much, you know, ending up with paychecks that, that they don't have enough to cover their rent, let alone their car payment and insurance and other things like that. So, um, just, you know, it's growing pains of, of the computer world, um, of, of instant gratification, you know, of, of just not understanding how money works. So, um, kind of these factors kind of all combined together just makes me really concerned about the direction that things are going because, um, people just, if they can't afford to live, you know, it's, it, there, there, there has to be a cliff at some point. So anyway, I'll get off my pedestal on that one. Um, let me know if you guys have any thoughts. Uh, I'd love to, love to hear others' opinions on where the market's going and, and how things look. And if you made it all the way through the video, I appreciate you taking the time to do so. Um, let me know again if there's anything I can do to make it more valuable. I'm still trying to work on, on shortening these as much as possible um, because I understand that you know 35 minutes is a really long time to listen to my voice. So anyway, thanks everyone for, for watching and um, yeah, let me know if there's anything I can do to improve. All right.